we light this candle to celebrate the inherent worth and dignity of every person and to share that love which is ultimately beyond even our cherished reason, the love which unites us. In bright sunlight, warm air and still evenings, seasons of colour and courage, God is in our midst. In hills outlined against the rising sun and the muted sounds of early morning walkers along the beach, God is in our midst. In the faces of families and those alone, the hurrying and the daydreaming, God is in our midst. In life touching other life, Moments of kindness, sharing of joys, caring for others. God is in our midst.
Today's reading comes from Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 to 28. Jesus spoke this parable to his disciples. It is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For the truth made known in texts, for the wisdom found on different paths, for the hope that leads us on, we give thanks.
The story commonly named The Parable of the Talents is one of those stories that has left its mark on our language and culture in a big way. Indeed, so much of it has become part of our everyday vocabulary that we tend to miss the sting hidden in its tail. And that's a pity. So how can we connect with this story, this parable? Some scholars suggest we can connect through the story's ecclesiastical context. And Matthew's original context is one of the great church debates of his, and especially this year, our day. Should we stay as we are, or should we change, become more of an inclusive community and let the others, the Gentiles, to use his parlance, people who are different, to let them in. Matthew's original church community is probably remembering the controversy over the expansion of the gospel into the Gentile world and the refusal of some Jews to accept that the doors should be flung open so recklessly. God is misbehaving again and they cannot believe it and they refuse to support the adventure. The so-called sting in the tale of the story is that the tragedy is that many people are afraid of losing or endangering God and so seek to protect God from adventures, to resist attempts at radical inclusion that might, they fear, compromise God's purity and holiness. We need to encourage people to stop putting God under the mattress. As we begin to trust allowing the Spirit to move through us, our lives change as individuals and our communities have a better chance of change. We in our time have a great opportunity here as we take our worship online and out of our buildings to a landscape much wider and a horizon much broader and recipients over whom the church has little control. Today's story by Matthew is an invitation for us as church to look beyond what we have been in the past. For we can no longer expect church to be what it once was. Such interpretations, which have tended to influence much clerical thinking over the years, focus in the story on the traveller or the owner and by analogy or metaphor, God. But a quite different interpretation of this story would be had if our focus was on the third servant and also seen from the perspective of a first century peasant person, the most likely person to have been in, in the audience during its original oral telling. Social commentators all around the place are constantly telling us we live in an era of incredibly fast change. What worked in building our faith communities, for example, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, or even only last year, are more than likely not going to work today. The landscapes of this country and the world are in rapid transition, yet Despite all this change, there is one part of our social conditioning which seems not to have changed in any radical sense. We still tend to hear this parable through capitalist ears, which views wealth as something that can be increased by hard work or investment. But in the social world of the parable, both in its original oral telling and in its later written form by the storyteller we call Matthew, it is thought there is only so much wealth, and an increase to one person takes away from another. Now from this perspective, the man who expects his money to be increased is the wicked one who is unfettered, 
in his greed. The third servant then is not wicked or incompetent except in the eyes of those who are greedy acquisitors or those who are co-opted by them as are the first two servants. The third servant is the one who acted honourably by blowing the whistle on the wickedness of the owner. So from this interpretation, the parable is a warning to the rich to stop exploiting the poor and is one that encourages poor people to take measures that expose such greed for the sin that it is. Parables are stories which turn our world views upside down. But is our world view the landscapes of the big wide world or the narrow confines of the church as institution. Because which world we view can make all the difference to how we live in the present and claim the future. Will the connection be through the world as the church institution? If so, is the future to be claimed by preserving, holding on, staying the same? Or is it claimed in freedom of action, acting boldly, changing? Will the connection be through the world global and social? If so, is the future to be claimed through a new interconnectedness of all life and the sustainability of resources? Or is it global commercialism, international corporations and third world debt. I invite you to ponder some more. We light this candle in remembrance and hope to call to mind Magnus and Ronald and all the saints and all those dear to us who have gone before, especially those who have died in recent times. And as a sign of hope to future generations as yet unborn, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life. A prayer. We are reminded that all humanity is connected. We are dependent on one another and on the earth. So may we live in love, caring for one another, building up one another in love and reverence. May those who are homeless encounter kindnesses on every corner. May they not only be offered funds, but guidance towards sustenance, 
both edible and spiritual. May they be safe when they do find a place to rest. And may they be assured that many are fighting to end the housing crisis even in the midst of this health crisis. In this season of remembrance, may lives be remembered for the unique gifts they were and remain to this world. May those who mourn find some comfort in those memories. And may all of us view these memories as clear and continuing calls to recommit to saving as many lives and memories as possible. We pray for those whose days are blurring together. May they have patience with themselves as they remember that no matter what phases and surges and moods and fears continue to ebb and flow. This world is still in the midst of a global pandemic. May they allow themselves more leeway to be discombobulated, knowing that discombobulation is currently the literal state of the world. And may they breathe, calmly look at a calendar, remind themselves where they are and what they have to do, and move slowly into whatever day it is. These are the words of our hearts. So may it be. Amen.
Our faith asks much of us. Sometimes it can feel too much. As we go from our time together, know that you are enough. Your presence and faithfulness are a great witness to God's love. May you stay safe in the way of Christ and may you be blessed by his Spirit this day and always. Amen.